Welcome to the official ceremonial launch of the forum at Harvard School of Public Health. Mm -hmm. uh, as you may have noticed, uh, this beautiful atrium has been temporarily dressed up uh, for this very, very special occasion where we're uh, launching this uh, new initiative of the forum. We hope uh, to someday remake this uh, space into a permanent place for the forum through fundraising over time. The forum at Harvard School of Public Health is a key element in our ambition to create a transformative capacity in the school. The capacity to engage people from science and leaders in, together in order to be able to translate both evidence and experience to uh, produce better policy uh, in, in favor of health. This large atrium uh, venue will be one of two venues uh, fostering these exchanges. We have recently created a small state-of-the-art broadcast studio in another building at the school in what used to be the Dean's conference room. The forum technology can send high-definition webcasts to anyone with a receiving device, from computers to mobile phones in any country. This 21st century approach to information transfer amplifies our reach and helps us to complete what I call the circle of knowledge. We produce knowledge through research, we reproduce knowledge through education, and it is also a key part of our mission to translate knowledge, knowledge that gets communicated to the public, to practitioners, and to policymakers in order to improve the health of populations. The Forum Initiative presents an incredible new opportunity for the Harvard School of Public Health to make an impact on the world in the 21st century. And we couldn't have found a better person with whom to launch the Forum than Ted Turner. Of course, Ted needs no introduction. He is truly one of the great innovators in the art and science of communication, which is so central to public health. Communication is one of our main tools to change behaviors and to actually inform and empower people in order to take charge of their own health. Uh, I, uh, of course, knew about Ted Turner, but I had a very personal uh, uh, relation when un unknown to him when the UN Foundation was uh, announced in September of 1997. That was the moment when the World Health Organization was undergoing a tremendous leadership crisis. New elections were coming up. And when that foundation got established, it coincided with the election of Gro Harlem Brundtland as the new director general of the World Health Organization. Gro Brundtland is probably our most distinguished alumna. She got her master's of public health from this school. And I was very fortunate that she invited me to be her collaborator and work with her in her cabinet as executive director of a new area of evidence and information for policy. And I want to tell you, Ted, that your gift at that time was such an expression of confidence in the UN system and in multilateralism that the effect it had in raising the morale of all of those, but at, but at that time I had started working in the UN system, of those, uh, those of us who were working there, that it had really a, an enormous effect in motivating us to pursue our mission. And it actually opened, it was the first of this kind of initiatives that opened a whole new era in global health. So we are truly delighted that it is uh, Ted Turner who is the first uh, speaker at the forum at Harvard uh, School of Public Health. I also want to thank uh, Abigail Trafford uh, for uh, being the moderator. She's an award-winning uh, journalist, an author, a former health editor of the Washington Post, and she will moderate today's conversation. So over to you, Abigail. Thank you so much. Thank you. And welcome to, uh, to all of you. This is a conversation, and we're going to explore today the vision for global health over the next decade. You know, both Ted and Julio are veteran warriors in the battle for better lives and better health. Um, Julio, you know, as Minister of Health in Mexico, you certainly were in the trenches of trying to improve health. And as dean, you have reinvigorated uh, global health as a priority at the school. And Ted, you know, your, your career is world-ranging. Uh, you've launched CNN, you've created uh, Captain Planet, you raised Bison, and of course, well, you have your support for the UN Foundation. Uh, the Millennium Goals 
of the UN Millennium Development Goals aim high. You know, eradicating po poverty, reducing the toll of disease. Some significant progress has been made, but many efforts have fallen short. Meanwhile, the Great Recession has cut funding. Uh, both Julio and Ted are members of the MDG Advisory Group, appointed by the UN Secretary of General to galvanize support for, the, for these goals and to mobilize action. In your work, both Ted and Julio are on the front lines. So we're going to explore the issues. And you know, Ted, I'm going to start with you. And here's an easy one. And as you look back on the last 10 years of your work with the UN Foundation, what are you proudest of? Uh, as far as the UN Foundation is concerned, that, that I had the idea to, uh, to, to, to start it and uh, followed through on it. Uh, and, and it has been successful beyond uh, what we ever could have hoped. Uh, for a 12-year-old foundation, uh, it's one of the more respected foundations uh, in the world today, and uh, that's mainly due to the hard work of our terrific staff that we have have there. Uh, but th that that would be the thing that probably that, that I would be proudest of, as far as concerned. But you know, both of you have had setbacks in your work. Uh, Julio, uh, I'm interested in what was a hard lesson learned in your experience? I mean, certainly when you were uh, in Mexico and you were trying to improve health coverage, you ran into a whole lot of obstacles. Can you say, how did that, how does that shape you as you look ahead to, in a sense, what needs to be done in global health? I, I did have the great opportunity of um, launching a process of health reform in, in you know, a developing country, Mexico, which, although it's a middle-income country, it's such an unequal country that you have very poor people there. Um, and it's exactly facing all this, the structural constraints that drive people into poverty and thinking, how, how do we, in a specific sector as health, deal with all of these other issues? I mean, the, the you know, environmental degradation, the uh, disempowerment of women, uh, illiteracy. And so one lesson I learned, which I think is very important for the MDGs, is that we need to stop thinking of health as a specialized sector and think of health as a shared social objective mm -hmm. in which we mobilize every tool of public policy for its advancement. Um, because, you know, in the end, health is the, the, the you know, the, the, the driver for everything else we do. It, very much drives our possibility of economic growth. It creates a sense of security. It leads to, an, to, to a, a sense of community and solidarity among people. So it, for me, facing that barrier of how limited the tools were, if I just saw the narrow set of policies we have in the health field, as opposed to thinking of health as a social objective, that's probably the, 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 the most important component. And I think that's in the spirit of the MDGs. Absolutely, yes. Well, Ted, uh, your experience, uh, you were in Nigeria recently to celebrate their success in reducing the toll of polio. But several years ago, that program was in collapse. Uh, people distrusted the program. They thought it was a plot that they were being poisoned. You know, people didn't want to have vaccinations and, and rates started to go up. So what did you learn from that experience? Well. We if you run into obstacles, and that was a, a large one, uh, you just keep working on it till you, uh, till you, till you're successful. But how did you how did you turn it around there? What did you have well, to I, do? That, did, that, that, that was the UN Foundation, the World Health Organization. There were a lot of people involved involved in in, in that, uh, but a lot of contact were made with leaders in Nigeria, and they, they were persuaded when they saw all the facts. That there was no truth to the to the rumors that were floating around that it was a a Christian plot to uh, have the Muslims cut back on their population. It was, the, the, the the rumor was that it sterilized uh, sterilized people. Oh. The, the, uh, the, yeah. the, the vaccinations. Yeah. 
So you really had to, you collectively, had to launch a campaign. You had to really do what Julio is saying, that, that this is a social mission, a social and a political mission in order to achieve a health objective. Well, you know, when you try and get everybody in the world to do the same thing, you're going to run into some problems. And uh, <laughs> really, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's pretty challenging. Well, you know, as they say, uh, all health is local. Wow. <laughs> I've never heard that. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all everything's local. Somewhere. But you know, on, on the on the polio vaccine, the. The other example is uh, the role that the national immunization days around polio eradication played in beginning the dialogue during the civil war in Central America. The warring factions stopped fighting to allow the kids to be immunized on both sides. And that just created the space for, for, for the beginning. So this is the, the, the other side of the coin where health becomes an, an instrument to advance understanding yeah. and peace yeah. as a tool of diplomacy in this case or in this case of peace. So. Exactly right. Yeah, because if you can quit fighting for one day, you can quit fighting, period. Right. <laughs> uh, 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 yes. <laughs> we should have more, yes, more and more health days. But now, what, what do you do about, um, how do you deal with waste and corruption? Uh, how do you, you know, let alone war and instability. And um, I mean, if a country doesn't have an infrastructure to provide the care that you're providing, uh, how can you leave sort of an enduring legacy? And do you ever think that maybe you're throwing good money after bad? So, Ted, what do you think? Well, it's, that's, it's a very complex, uh, very complex question. If you, if you break it down just to immuni immunization, uh, it's fairly easy because even corrupt governments want their children to. Uh, it, 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 and it's pretty hard to, to, to get rich stealing vaccine. So <laughs> and it's, it's easy to do it with drugs. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. So th th I don't think it really is, is a problem as far as uh, the immunization program that we have going all over, the, all over the world. When you're talking about economic aid, that's a totally separate situation. And if you just give billions of dollars to some uh, dictator in some country where where the money's all going to bank in Switzerland in his personal bank account, that's not, that's not smart. Uh, but, but that's generally known uh, uh, in, the, in the global governance uh, community, uh, which countries are that way. And you, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to help them because if you do give the money, it, it's no point in giving money to a country that's where the money's gonna get stolen because it doesn't, you, you might as well give it where there's Good governance, and then hopefully, good gov good governance is important everywhere. It's important here in the United States. I'm concerned that our governance governance here is lacking. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we can't get a uh, a climate uh, bill through. They had a horrible time getting the uh, health care bill through, and and right now the Congress is pretty much in in gridlock. Um, we have a, we have a, and they, and there's corruption in our in our government. Uh, Congressman Rangel was stealing money from uh, the taxpayers, and not everybody's doing it. It's, it's relatively, I think it's relatively. People in the United States are are more honest than they are in some some countries, but but it is it is a complex problem that we need to deal with, and 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 education is the best way to, uh, I think get away from corruption, doing something dishonest to me is unthinkable. But I was raised in a family and schools, good, good schooling, and I was taught that you're not supposed to steal from a little nino. <laughs> and uh, so, so I, I, my whole life, I, I've always just done what I was told to do. <laughs> just following instructions. Yeah. Oh, I was glad. told to give, give your money away, you know, alms for the poor, right? Yeah, Help those less fortunate than yourself. It's more <laughs> blessed to give than to receive. All of our religions say that. So, so I just said, give your money away. I gave my money away. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> well, but maybe uh, Julio, pick up on, uh, say, a program in a country that, a health program that's not going to work if you have an unstable government or a corrupt government or you don't have a health care infrastructure. For instance, how are you going to take care of AIDS patients if you don't have a health infrastructure to really continue the care? 
you know, the great thing of the MDGs, and uh, I'm very honored to be in Ted's company as part of this uh, advocates uh, group of, that the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon established recently, along with, uh, you know, people of great stature uh, like Ted. But the great thing of the MDGs is that it has, for the first time, I think, created a framework of accountability, of mutual mm -hmm. accountability. Every single country on mm -hmm. Earth signed up to a series of specific goals and targets. And we have a deadline. Mm -hmm. And we are holding each other accountable. You know, it, more than the specific content, although I think these are the right goals, it's the fact that it created this framework for accountability. And yet, governments need to figure out how they're going to reach this. Because come 2015, we're all going to be there. And those countries that don't meet the goals will have to explain to their own people, first and foremost, and then to the world at large, why they failed to, to do this. So, and it's then up to us uh, everywhere to avoid that scenario and help each other reach those goals, because those are also essential goals for the world as a whole. So that, that to me, is the great uh, virtue of the Millennium Development Goals. Well, you know, one, one criticism you hear of global health is it's kind of like, um, I sort of call it helicopter health. You know, like helicopter parents, you have helicopter health. You go into a disaster, you try to fix the disaster, uh, but then you leave. And uh, there's no sustaining effort. Uh, is there, what's going on as far as policies and global health to, in a sense, make sustainability an issue? Yeah. Well, it, that, that's, that's key. I mean, every country has to build the capacity. We, we need to strengthen the health systems. Um, and, and, you know, you, you were talking about misuse of resources. The fact of the matter is that is certainly a problem, but the vast majority of health systems in the world are grossly underfinanced. It's hard to believe that when we're sitting here in the United States spending 17% of GDP on health, $2.4 trillion, $7,000 per capita. But there are many countries in Africa that are spending less than $10 per capita. So the first point is that there is a gross underfinancing. Part of that is because there are other priorities. We were talking about the effects of militarism and diverting resources to other uses. Uh, but, so you know, there's a first fact that you, we need to strengthen those health systems by making it clear that <coughs> health is an investment. It's mm -hmm. the basic platform on which you can then build other development goals. As Schopenhauer said, health is not everything, but without health, there's nothing. <laughs> well, now let's look at the elephant in this room, which is really the Great Recession. And donor countries have uh, foreclosed on their pledges to support global health. The money's not there. And so how do you adjust your priorities? And really, what is the new vision for global health in these new circumstances? And where's the leadership coming from? I'm not I'm sure. I'm looking at you. I, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm not sure. It's, it's very, very complex. Uh, but the people that aren't paying, that have, aren't meeting their, uh, their, their agreed to obligations, uh, hopefully, if they're reminded of it, uh, <laughs> They'll, they'll pay, you know, the bill collector, you know, the repo man. Mm -hmm. uh, that that the may repo work. Man we, we, to Germany? I think that I think that's what I think that's what uh, our little group of advocates that the main job is going to be is we're going to go around and, and to talk to the people that aren't paying and try and encourage them to pay. But uh, if you just not if, if the money's not there. Well, well but the money the, is there. Yeah, exactly. It's somewhere. <laughs> you can print more. Oh, good. <laughs> That's what America does. <laughs> the American it, way. It leads to inflation, uh, but um, that makes everything cheaper. <laughs> but you see different I responses. Think, I mean, it's more some... expensive. No, it's cheaper. <laughs> It's not good. <laughs> Deflation makes things more expensive. You have to understand these things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're going to be on all these international committees. I understand. <laughs> countries have, countries have differed in, in, in what they've done in, in response to the recession. Uh, 
talking of donor countries, I mean, you have the case of the new government in the UK, which has been carrying out these draconian budget cuts, and very explicitly, they exempted, inter in fact, they increased the budget of, of the Department for International Development, uh, saying these are international commitments. Other European countries have done exactly what you're saying. Um, you know, the Obama administration, in the midst of the recession, launched the Global Health Initiative. It is not that every country is cutting. And there's one lesson we have from previous recessions. It's the worst time to cut expenditures on health. It's exactly when people are losing their jobs, when they are losing insurance, when you need people healthy even to fuel their recovery. Mm -hmm. So one thing we know from past experience is that th this is not the time to cut health budgets or assistance for health. And some countries have learned those lessons. So it's, you know, we see better, better responses. Well, I'm going to ask you again, where's the leadership coming? I mean, I know it's coming from two, the two of you. Uh, and, and certainly, um, the, 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 you, you know, right here. But you wonder, uh, you, I, there's still the impression that global health is faltering. So It's not faltering. That's wrong. OK, good. Tell me. The media doesn't cover it very well. But uh, uh, mm -hmm. because of the rise uh, in the standard of living, and the incomes in both China and India primarily, uh, the, the incidence of poverty in the world in the last few years has gone down dramatically, percentage-wise. And uh, uh, we, we, we are making progress to, uh, towards uh, reducing poverty and, ha and have, even, even with the uh, world economy and, uh, un under, and challenged as, as it is at the current time. I don't have the exact figures, but I think hundreds of thousands of people in China have been lifted out, out of poverty, uh, as it's defined, mm -hmm. and also in India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and on the health-related MDGs, I mean, we've been getting, you know, news that are, are, are good cause for optimism. Maternal deaths, which had been stubbornly stuck at about half a million a year. Uh, now we see for the first time in the, first, in the last few years a reduction. You know, still an unacceptably high number, about 380,000 deaths a year. And this is still the most inequitably distributed indicator in the world. About 99% of those deaths happen in poor countries. But we are finally breaking through with innovations in, you know, the way we deliver services, the, uh, some, some very interesting innovations in India with conditional cash transfers to motivate poor women to go and deliver in, in healthcare facilities where the chances that a woman will survive uh, uh, what should not be a cause of death and is not a cause of death in rich countries uh, are greatly increased. Um, it, likewise with infant mortality or childhood mortality, we're finally seeing some breakthrough. Uh, there's still a long way to go, but I do think we, we have to put out the message that we are moving in the right direction. Um, the goal is still far away, but I think most countries will actually achieve, certainly MDG 4. When you look at M MDG, uh, Millennium Development Goal 6, on the big infectious diseases, I mean, what's happened with AIDS is really one of the most outstanding examples of people working together a few years ago. You know, it was inconceiv inconceivable that poor people would have access to antiretrovirals. Today, there's five million people, most of them in Africa, who now have the chance of making what was used to be a death sentence into a chronic disease that can be managed. Mm -hmm. uh, th that's an extraordinary achievement. It was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, triumph of diplomacy, of business, of advocates. Uh, the UN Foundation played a major role because the UN launched the first special uh, UN General Assembly special session on AIDS in 2001, and that triggered things like the creation of the Global Fund mm -hmm. uh, to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. We are starting to see progress. Uh, it's not that we can now let the guard down, not at all. There's five years left. But I think we need to have the confidence that those goals can be met. Well, I'd, I'd like to stay with the subject uh, uh, of women. Uh, because um, it seems as though the focus on women has really gotten much broader than reducing maternal deaths. It's also about access to uh, reproductive uh, technology. It's about education. It's about empowerment. And um, tell us a little bit about you know what's really a comprehensive program in global health that, in a sense, supports 
women, what would that look like? And maybe you have some experiences in that. Yes, we, we have here at the Harvard School of Public Health just launched the, uh, an initiative called Women and Health. Not only women's health, but women and health. Uh -huh. Trying to analyze the health needs of women, both you know, issues like maternal mortality, which is truly a, a, a top priority for the world to deal, but also you know, as more women uh, live longer, uh, they get exposed to new challenges like breast cancer, cancer of the cervix. And then there's chronic diseases that women share with men, uh, but where there's a lot of evidence that women get do not get treated as, as frequently or as, uh, with, with the same level of quality. So there's a whole idea of looking at women's health throughout the entire life cycle. But women not only have health needs, women are the driving force of health systems. Most mm -hmm. healthcare workers in the world are women. Mm -hmm. In fact, very soon, even in this country, the majority of physicians will be women. Uh, Women also provide most of the informal care that happens at home when there is someone chronically ill, without which the formal health system would not be able to operate. And we often do not value enough you know, what that contribution is. So uh, women make most of the health-related decisions for the household. So analyzing the way these two sides of the equation work, the specific health of needs of women, and how their biological advantage, which is a, <laughs> a fact of life, gets undercut by social systems that uh, uh, disempower women and they end up dying more than, 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 than men. So their health needs of women and then women as a big part of, or the major part of the solution of what drives health systems. That's what I think is a great uh, agenda. And the UN has taken a very important step now, establishing now a, a, a comprehensive integrated program for women. And you know, I'm very happy to, to, to see not just an admirable woman, but also a physician who happened to be president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, who mm -hmm. is now the first leader of, of that, who was also in our group of, U, of MDG advocates. Now she's going to have to leave because she has to, to lead this new um, uh, program at the UN looking comprehensively to, to women's issues. Yeah. Well, now, Ted, you've always been a supporter of women. I like them. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I like men, too. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> not the same. It's not the same. Uh, when you also have been a big supporter for access to uh, family planning. Yep. And, uh, and recently at a meeting, you called for a global policy of one child. Well, totally voluntary. For, for, and just for 100 years. OK, well, t <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. I'll do that. <laughs> talk, t talk a little bit more about that. Well. I, I, population is a problem. One reason why we have, the, and the, 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 the biggest reason that we have this uh, terrible problem with the atmosphere and, uh, and, and, and the global climate change problem is because there are seven billion people on the world, in the world. When I was born just 70 years ago, there were two billion. In, in 70 years, the population has grown three and a half times. That's, obviously unsustainable and the natural world is collapsing G global climate change is just one symptom the oceans are overfished they're collapsing the, the topsoils are uh, being uh, plowed uh, unsustainably the forests are being cut down uh, to make room for all of these additional people and and we're we're projected to add two billion more people in the next 25 years which is it, it it, it, uh, it's not going to, uh, we're not going to survive. We, well, maybe a few people will, but we're going to have a collapse of our civilization if we keep, keep uh, so many people. And, and it's, it's going to be impossible to eradicate, eradicate poverty. Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb 30 years ago, which I read, and I had him come out and visit me for a weekend from Sanford, and I asked him, I said, one of the things I was is, what would be the ideal population for the world? If you, if you, when, you get, when you're a farmer and you have cattle or bison, you, you have so many acres, 100,000 acres, you can take 5,000 cows or, or 5,000 bison and have enough food for them to live well. And, and I said, How, what would be the ideal population of the human race in the world where everybody would live at the standard of living of the United States? If, if you, 
if you're going to have 10 billion people, you're going to have to live at the standard of living of Ethiopia. Whereas if you had 2 billion, you could live at the standard of the United States where everybody has a car and a TV set and a decent housing and, and, help, and can afford good food. And he said two, two and a half billion people. I said, well, how about just a few hundred million? And he said, no, because if you have two, if you have less than two, two, two and a half billion, you won't be able to have uh, airline travel and uh, 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 super trains that are efficient and so forth. The, the, the world, the natural world can support two to two and a half billion people living at, in a, a Western lifestyle. And uh, so, and I've watched the population from that meeting go from three billion people. I have five children. And, but when I had those children 40 years ago, the world population was only three billion. It was ha less than half what it is today. And uh, so I didn't really, I, I knew what the projections were, but I didn't really believe them. You know, I, how could you double the number of people? You know, it, it just seemed, it, it, but we've done it and, and, and more so. so that's why I call for it. I think that the one child plan in China has been a big success. Now it's coercive and my plan is not coercive, it's voluntary. You say, well, people aren't gonna do it. Well, sooner or later, that's why it's so important that integrity, teaching our children integrity, because if we're going to live together in a, in a particularly in a crowded world with all the complications, if we aren't honest, because that does make the Millennium Development Goals mm -hmm. difficult to achieve if, if there's a lot of corruption and dishonesty because we're not gonna give money to those people. We're not gonna give money to them so that their people are gonna still be living yeah. in poverty. And, and, and we know that it, it, poverty is one of the causes where terrorists come from. Terrorists don't come from Harvard, you know. They come from where they didn't get to go to college at all or didn't get to go to school, they have no, Terrorists have, have, for the most part, don't have any uh, alternative that, except to blow themselves up. You know, they, they have no jobs. It, in, in a lot of the world, they have 40% unemployment. You know, not, we're, we're crying because we have 10% unemployment. But population is one of the three things. We've got to get rid of nuclear weapons. We've got to get, uh, preserve the environment and particularly get uh, the CO2 down, the carbon down. And we've got to uh, we've got to stabilize the population well, as just, quickly as we can. But how? And with and, and with a and with a one child family, if everybody had one child, uh -huh. if every couple had one child, then in a hundred years the population through natural attrition would go back to around two billion. Then we could have two children. Everybody could have two children from then <laughs> then on. Well, it's something to work for, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you you want to go to college? You start saving some money. You know, you want to buy a house? You used to have to have a down payment. You want to buy a car? That was back before we had, where everybody was broke, like now. You know, where, where houses went down 20, 30%. Houses used to maintain their value. That used to be a good way to save money. But the problem is we pushed the prices of houses up too much and we lent people too much with our banking system. The, the, the reason everybody wants to blame the Democrats and the Republicans for the recession, but it's our own fault. We're the ones that did it. We spent money we didn't have, and we did it for years. And then finally, the money ran out. <laughs> but uh, Ted, you said something that I think is, is very important. Uh, this is voluntary. And then the question is, what motivates people to yeah. control their fertility? And the one a lot observation- of things, Education of women. Uh, education, uh, employment opportunities, and the reduction of infant mortality. Absolutely. The, the, mm -hmm. every we spend society, most of our money at the UN right. Foundation on infant mortality, with measles, polio, and uh, malaria. And, and we've made tremendous strides, all of us. Not, we're not the only ones. The Gates Foundation, the World Health, all these organizations you've been through, you know, you, you're mm -hmm. a real pro at this. <laughs> I'm mainly, mainly a television man myself. <laughs> I started the Cartoon Network, you know. <laughs> I was in charge of laughter around the world. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's hard to kill somebody when you're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> you don't feel angry and mean, you know. Yeah. You got a good chuckle. <laughs> Isn't that true? How many people in this room want to kill somebody? <laughs> well, we're killing people every day over there in Afghanistan, why? because our policies have gotten screwed up. I mean, how many people from Afghanistan have come over here and killed people? I know they did at the World Trade Center. 
but, but it's very rare. And I think, I have a theory that if you don't bomb other people, they won't bomb you. I, I know it, it hasn't been tried yet, but it, <laughs> it, it might be good to try it. I mean, what do we have to lose, you know? It'd be better for our health. That's right. It's, be, it's much better for your health. Much better. <laughs> well, we've really batted around a whole lot of ideas, and I would like to open this up to some questions. And so there are microphones around. Please give your name and your affiliation, and we will try to answer your questions. I'm taking my pills because I need to for my health. <laughs> your role model. Hi, um, my name is Cala Bello, and I'm a second year um, master's student in the Global Health Department with a background in media and communications. And um, I had a question in regards to media. I, I wanted to know what you felt the, uh, sorry, Mr. Turner. I wanted to know what you felt the role for media was in promoting global health, and if you feel that media has an important role to play. And um, you had mentioned that the media isn't covering global health, and I want to know what your um, feedback was on why that might be possible. And I have another short portion to the question. I, I, I feel like if there's greater attention to global health in the media, then perhaps the citizens of the global north would be more supportive of global funding going out to, to countries outside of their, their own. So I wanted to know your feedback on that. This is a question about, the, the uh, in a sense, the message gap and uh, the role of the media. And um, I'm paraphrasing your question that um, uh, what do you think as far as the, the media covering global health? And it seems that they're not covering global health. And if, they, if it were better covered, would it then be easier to achieve goals and get money out of the uh, donors to support global health? That in a sense, you know, you, you created Captain Planet. Maybe you need to create Captain Health to have people understand what the issues are. How do you communicate with the public on global health? Well, the health? best way to communicate with the public is through the mass media, mm -hmm. of which television is just one part. You've mm -hmm. got radio, you've got newspapers, magazines, uh, and the internet, which has been growing very, very rapidly. Uh, but, but the traditional media, particularly television, because I'm more familiar with that even though I don't spend much time with it now that I'm out of it, um, I, I think there's been a, an emphasis uh, in the news area on television to uh, uh, concentrate more on uh, movie stars, tr trivial, tri mm -hmm. trivial stuff of human interest. Mm -hmm. It's not really, to me, it's not really news. And uh, I, I think the media is letting us down as a society by not having more serious news. You, you've been a serious journalist, U.S. News and World Report. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, Time Magazine now may have a movie star on the cover <laughs> as, as much as a, as a global newsmaker. And uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that we're being underinformed. On the other hand, we would have been better informed if we chose to watch those programs, that they'd give them to us. They'd give the serious international news coverage. Uh, uh, for instance, I, I did a special years ago on CNN, a week-long special on hunger in Africa, and it was the lowest-rated week we ever had. We go, people have are, are 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 sick of looking at starving people standing in line with a bowl in their hand. You know, with, with people giving them a little bit of food, it makes us feel bad. It's hard to go out to dinner, you know, and have a big steak and potatoes and everything when you've just left the television set watching these people that have absolutely nothing. So uh, it's, it's all of our fault. And, uh, but, 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 but we do it at our peril because we are underinformed, and uh, particularly in America where we think we know so much and where we have a free press and everything, uh, we have all the advantages, but we're not taking advantage of them because the marketplace has pushed the serious international news off the air. What to do a we large do? degree, am I uh, right or not? Uh, yes, I, I, I think that there's been a huge media gap here. All right, what, how do we fix that? The only way you can do it is to get people running the media, it's leadership, mm -hmm. running the media that put uh, informing the public as their first obligation rather than uh, making the maximum profit by running, you know, the latest 
Oprah Winfield or Star. Or what 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 are those programs now that, that you know fire where they fire Donald Trump or he fires people? <laughs> <laughs> Dancing with the Stars, Dancing that's one the of them. You know, that's, that's what we need. <laughs> uh, well, how, what, uh, how do you, uh, how do you, uh, how do you uh, shape the I was, message? I was, I, the reason that, that, that I'm as respected as I am around the world is because when I ran CNN, it was that way. Now, we ran, we, we did run some sensational stories. When Jessica fell down the well, we covered it from, right. and when O.J. Simpson, oh, yeah. we even had the a meeting man. of our executives after the, Je Jessica down the well. Everybody remembers that story. I mean, we wanted to know if we were going to get her out. It was like those miners in Chile. It was a great story, you know. But uh, w w the ratings were so high during Jessica's time that one of our executives suggested that we go around and put candy bars around uh, <laughs> vacant wells. <laughs> Isn't that it was all a joke. He was joking. He, he, he was joking. I want to make it clear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how do you get the news? But that's how these stories get on the air. You know, you're sitting around having this, we should cover this, we should cover that, or we shouldn't cover this, we shouldn't cover that. And too much of the programming people are in there that are, are responsible for the ratings. And they, they, want it, they, want, they want O.J. Simpson to drive around Los Angeles for 24 hours. <laughs> you know, and you follow him in a helicopter, right? Well, what's he going to do now? <laughs> Well, how do we translate that into covering global health? How well, do you make that a hot story? Well, you're not going to get global health on the 6 o'clock news unless they come up with a, with a solution for polio or something <laughs> really big because it's just, it, first of all, it's too technical. You know, it's, it, the average person doesn't really understand it. Uh, I don't understand it fully, completely, and I, I give, give hundreds of millions of dollars to, to dealing with it. Or when you have a, something like H1N1, then, then, then that's, mm -hmm. you know, when you have an epidemic, a pandemic like we had with, with H1N1, uh, mm -hmm. with the influenza, uh, that's when you get on, 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 on the media. But the other thing you do is, in universities, you create programs. I mean, our student here is in a concentration right. in communication. We teach this. We have a Center for Health Communication. There's some people the, watching this on the Internet. We, right? We, we, we've got to you know, come up with alternative media, do whatever we can, and, 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 and choose to read uh, serious magazines. Like, my main source of news is The Economist now, not CNN. As much as I love it, I want to turn it on every morning and say, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was no news on CNN this morning about Cancun. That, that I, that I, I didn't see it on hardly any channels where, where they're having these big uh, conferences going on right now. I was there last weekend. I'm, I, I, you know, I've kind of volunteered to, to do this. It's without pay. And I, nobody appointed me. I just appointed myself. I got to do something. When I got fired from Time Warner and uh, I had to have something to do, I started a restaurant chain so I'd have a little business to worry with. And then uh, I decided to take on the world's problems. And But I'd already done that with CNN. So anyway it's 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 fun it's fun dealing with it yes another question my name is teresa shaheen i'm a recent graduate and i'm interested in innovation and entrepreneurship and social impact and public health so first i'd like to congratulate everyone on the first forum at hsph and secondly i'd like to ask a question about the topic you were talking about earlier related to governments accountability corruption and effectiveness so traditionally speaking using a public health diagram, when we have countries with money and knowledge and resources, the arrow has been going through governments as an intermediary factor to the final outcome of improving health for the bottom billion. To what extent do we want to continue on that route given the deadlines to meet the MDGs? And to what extent do we want to draw another arrow so that focusing on improving governments is one goal? and focusing on directly improving health through social entrepreneurship and scaling up from the bottom can maybe a more effective way to reach the MDGs. You, was, that <laughs> was that a question? I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's the world's longest question. Yeah. Well, are you ready to tackle that? In other words, mostly well, we did. First of all, you've got to translate I am. I'm going it to. Yeah, I am. 
uh, I'm, I'm deaf too. Yeah. <laughs> and this is this is a quick translation, and that okay, is good. conventionally we usually do global health starting from the top, the governments, and down, and uh, do programs. What about social entrepreneurship? and starting from the grassroots, starting from down, and building programs up. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Have we got any examples? Is this? I don't know. I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not a I'm healthcare. moving over. Okay, yes. there you yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> we got an expert here. Yeah. Julio, I mean, are you seeing that taking place? Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, the, I mean, here at the Harvard School of Public Health with the business school, there's a whole program called uh, Project Antares aimed exactly at creating uh, social entrepreneurship as, as a way of you know, empowering people to uh, create sustainable means to, to generate income. And through that, uh, you, know, you can add everything else. And some of those can be health-related. Um, you know, a lot of uh, micro-enterprises or, or uh, micro-franchising models around health, around uh, health-related activities, are, are very interesting examples which we study and build cases about. So I think it's a it's a it's an alternative route, uh, which I don't think is substitute to governmental action, but it it, it can be um, very important. Uh, another question. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Binaguao. I'm the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health in Rwanda, and uh, by hazard I'm here, and I'm very happy to be here. So, um, I find TED quite provocative. And uh, for one reason, family planning. One child, one family, perfect. But believe that it will change the global warming, I'm not sure. We can talk about that, but if I come home and say to the uh, families of Rwanda, let's go for one child, we'll change the global warming, <laughs> They will look at me and say, yes, but all those factories, all those planes, we never enter in a plane. We never, so if you want two child, why should be penalized? Because there is a world there that doesn't, that is not ready to change. So I think it's a shortcut and we need to be very careful. For the reason to family planning, yes, if we save children and we keep them alive, totally right. Family will never go for one child if the child will die along the way. They need the child and die with the child alive and grandchild. And uh, for the, the question, uh, to going aside government, yes and no. You will never reach the MDGs if you don't strengthen the public service overseas. We need good hospital, we need good public service, uh, to save life and um, there is community health workers but most of them are non-professional and uh, if we want to reach the MDGs for sure there are a lot of problems with many governments by passing through uh, money through government corruption overseas and here as well because corruption have always two hands there is the one who give and know that give to corrupt governments, and they are the one who receive the money and put it aside for other things. But I strongly believe that with more accountability, more monitoring and evaluation, strengthening the public service, we can reach the MDGs. In my country, we have this decreased the rate of death of women by eight in two years by simple new technology implementation with community health workers. But we have to do that also by strengthening the public service, where the woman can go at an affordable price. So that was my contribution. But global warming that doesn't come necessarily from babies. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for that comment. I, I would like to pick up and ask our panelists. Uh, what, was the, what was the question? Well, it was a... <laughs> it was a, uh, it was a uh, discussion. Um, a discussion of really the, it, it, it boiling down to the need for strengthening public service and hospitals in countries and that uh, having a policy of one child 
is, is not realistic unless you have, uh, that child is going to survive and you really lower infant mortality. And again, it circles back again to this idea of building up the infrastructure in the country and public services and hospitals. And, and maybe Julio, you could talk a little bit about how much is that part of the agenda for global health of strengthening, in a sense, the infrastructure in countries in order to deliver the kinds of care that are necessary to meet the goals. Sure. Uh, let me just say that uh, Agnes, we're very happy she's here because she's the permanent secretary uh, at the Ministry of Health in Rwanda, but actually the co-chair of this advocacy, the, this group of advocates for the MDGs is President Paul Kagame of, of Rwanda, and Rwanda is certainly one of the countries that have made greater progress uh, towards the MDGs. Exactly an, an example of a country that is coming out of a terrible crisis with the genocide was able to build uh, sound governance, uh, very effective governance, and, and really focus resources, including what is <coughs> truly an amazing story, which is the use of information technology, uh, leapfrogging towards some of these achievements, and then strong innovations in your point uh, of strengthening health systems. Uh, that is an absolute requirement. I mean, a big part of what's happened with global health is we've gone into this uh, vertical programs, disease specific, which tend to fragment the health system. We need to create sustainable systems, like Rwanda has done with a system of uh, health insurance for very poor people. And here you have a uh, country in Africa, again, being a, a reason for uh, for optimism and, 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 and hope. And one last point I would say is that, um, yeah, I think when we, when we talk about family planning, I mean, we, we like in public health to think of reproductive health and think of this as a question of the reproductive rights of men and women, but especially women, and about creating all the social conditions so that women can actually exercise the right to decide freely the number of children. And that involves, as we were saying, empowerment, education, opportunities for employment, and the certainty that children will survive. Um, and that's why, you know, the, although paradoxically, if you have more children survive, surviving, you would think that that fuels the population explosion. The one thing we know is that every place where fertility has come down, it was always preceded by an effort to reduce infant mortality. Then you get the motivation, and that's when then health systems need to be strong to deliver the family planning and reproductive health programs that will then meet the demands, mostly of women who have been empowered to exercise that demand. So it's, I think it's a framework of, of rights uh, uh, that, is, that gives us the, the complete picture. And, and let's not forget equality for women too. Yeah. Wherever women have equal opportunities with men, where they've got equal education opportunities, the, the birth rate goes down dramatically when women have other alternatives besides just uh, carrying water on their head and that, getting pregnant. Right. Absolutely. Yes, another question. Hello, my name is Shel Havit Simcha Cohen. Um, I'm currently a PhD at Harvard. I'm developing um, a Sesame Street for grown ups. And I wanted to ask Ted Turner um, as a media. If I may say, a brilliant media inventor, I want to ask for your for your sincere opinion of um, utilizing media and humor as a leveraging tool for broadcasting wellness values and health messages. Using humor and I mean everything we have in, in the media, humor, reality, all those attractive things to broadcast these positive messages and information, like positive news and you know, good things that are happening and good information for well-being. Ted, um, the, uh, I'm hard of hearing why she has to interpret for me. <laughs> uh, she is developing a program, a Sesame Street for adults. It's a way to provide a program that uses humor and sort of real situations as a way to convey important information about health and uh, engage people. It's about, you know, uh, and what advice can you give her? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> she needs That's more. interesting. Uh, uh, but this I, is, I hope it's successful. What would be the keys to make it successful? I mean, you did People Captain like Planet. 
Right. How do you get people to like it? How do you get people to say, turn that's it what, on? That's what you have to use your judgment for. That's what you're given a brain for, to figure that out. If you can't figure it out, then you're not going to be successful. But we want to encourage this. We want to encourage this. Do you have a follow-up? Do you think this is a good idea to do? I, 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 I don't know enough about it. I, I'd have to look into it more carefully. I, I don't make decisions like that. I thought three years before I started CNN, thought about it every day, and went through all the ramifications. What could go wrong? What could go right? Where will the threats be? And it worked. Yeah. I think it might work. Another question. Hi, my name is Yvette Efebera. I'm currently a second year master's student here in the Department of Global Health and Population. And my question is actually for both of you. Um, Dean Frank, you said in particular to think of health not as a separate sector, but as a social sector um, or social sphere. And I guess my question uh, to both of you, since you have had influences either directly or indirectly in health policy, is how we can formulate this social sphere using cultural competency in the policies that are promoted worldwide. Julio, do you want to take? Well, uh, you know, what I said is we need to think of health as a social objective not as a specialized sector that one agency or one ministry is responsible for. That ministry in a country is responsible for mobilizing all tools of policy, but many of those tools lie elsewhere. For example, if you take tobacco, the most important tool we have to reduce or prevent tobacco usage is fiscal policies, increasing the taxes on tobacco. If we think of the huge epidemic of motor vehicle uh, uh, injury and deaths from, from motor vehicle accidents, you have to utilize uh, policies around safety. Um, the nutrition sphere is a fundamental one where you need to educate and you need to have a complete set of policies with re regulatory approaches and, and, and so forth. It's the idea that you mobilize every sector of public policy in the pursuit of the social objective of health, rather than thinking that this is something that only specialized people should care about. And, and that's what I think is the spirit of the Millennium Development Goals. And, and this is the new thinking that health is that kind of objective where you mobilize all of these other tools uh, in, in order to achieve it. Well, we've certainly had a wide-ranging discussion. I'm afraid we're getting to the end. I'd like to conclude from this is that what we should do is give all the money to women, and then the world <laughs> would be better off. <laughs> <laughs> but on this, Julio, do you have some final thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, the first thought is to thank you, Abigail, for uh, having <laughs> accepted to moderate this and with your enormous skill as a seasoned journalist uh, to, to get us uh, engaged and thank all the, the audience for participating, especially you can see why we're so proud of our students because they're bright and they make excellent questions. This is the reason why working in a place like Harvard School of Public Health is always a reason for, for hope because you see the next generation coming through very nicely. And most of all, I want to thank Ted Turner uh, for having agreed to launch the forum at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, this is a, a major initiative here where we're trying to create what the word forum implies, a, a meeting ground where leaders like yourself who have been great innovators who then have directed uh, you know, the wealth that you have received thanks to that innovation to the best causes, who really have created a movement of trust in our multilateral system through the UN Foundation uh, and taking up some of these causes, bringing you here, having the opportunity of interacting with our students, as you saw, with our faculty, and bringing together these two worlds, the, worlds, uh, the world of scientists and people in academia and the world of leaders and practitioners and policy makers. That's the purpose of the, of the forum, and that is the idea that in that way we bring together uh, our knowledge as the most powerful tool we have to exercise enlightened and purposeful social transformation. Um, you are the emblematic person to have launched this because of your, the multiple facets of your career, and I really want to thank you on behalf of the entire community at the Harvard School of Public Health for having agreed to do that. Uh, and to all of you, uh, our very, very best wishes 
for a happy and very uh, peaceful and healthy holiday season. <laughs>